Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the colloquium talk in the Computational Science Research Center. Uh, we are coming to the end of a eventful 2020, but we certainly are ending with a uh, talk that is very near and dear to my heart in terms of origami and using structural design, materials design. I'm happy to introduce today, today our speaker, Dr. Edwin Peraza Hernandez, who is an assistant professor in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at University of California, Irvine. Uh, he got his uh, education at Texas A&M University and has been very productive and prolific in publications and including writing a book on the use of origami in um, materials design. So uh, without taking any more of his time, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Hernandez to the CSRC, uh, since we have a joint program, we hope we can find avenues for collaborations Definitely. and mm -hmm. uh, look forward to your talk. The floor is yours or the screen is All yours. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Sachi, for this very kind introduction. So uh, just repeating a little bit, my name is Edwin Peraza Hernandez and I am an assistant professor. I am currently in my third year as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at UC Irvine. So we are very close. And it's a big honor for me to be here and presenting in this colloquium, which uh, I have seen the previous talks uh, around. So all very, very super nice. So uh, my topic today is on smart structures and manufacturing enabled by tensegrity principles. Of course, there are uh, several applications of origami and tensegrity now, uh, especially over the last decades on smart structures and manufacturing. I will be focusing on the activities that we're doing in my research group and as, of course, to look for venues for collaboration and also show you some of the uh, activities that we're doing. So let's begin. So the first question is about uh, what is origami? So origami uh, is, as it's saying in the bullet point, is the art uh, of very ancient art, uh, probably in, in Japan. Some uh, places not also say, say China. Uh, it's a little bit uh, of complicated history there. Uh, but at the high level, it was embedded as the art of folding sheets of papers into different shapes and figures. What you're seeing on the left is two different examples from what happens once you start applying knowledge of computational geometry, of mathematics into origami. So you are able to create fold patterns that are very, very complex and can allow you to do very complicated shapes. So for example, the scorpion body leg by Robert Lang, who is one of the pioneers on com uh, ori computational origami. And uh, Tomohiro Tashi, who has uh, invented the approach called origamizer, where you can give a certain uh, three-dimensional target shape and be able to create a uh, fold pattern in the plane that you are able to fold into your target shape. What you're seeing in the middle is my take on the origamizer approach even though it's a little hard to see because of the size, uh, those folds that you see in that uh, bone in the middle are actually small plates, which you can uh, then start in embedding material properties. You can start thinking about creating smart structures by introducing st structural mechanics into origami. Origami has, of course, has found very interesting applications, uh, futuristic applications, which are currently undergoing research, what you're seeing on the top right is a deployable flasher by Howell et al. and all that group in Brigham Young University. And what you're seeing at the bottom is a self-foldable robot, which was created by people, uh, Daniela Ross at uh, MIT. So now, uh, after we answer this question of what is origami, I will go into what is tensegrity, and then we go dive into the topics. So the second thing, the second concept that we're going to learn today is uh, what is tensegrity. So tensegrity systems, you can think of as a set of bodies. Uh, they can be bars, they can be any type of uh, object, which you kind of connect through a network of pre-stressable loaded members. These normally are called strings. And this collection of bodies and network of string members is a pre-stressable structure, which means that you can change the stress and the tension in each one of the members to be able to change the shape uh, and the stiffness of the structure. Or, uh, tensegrity uh, dates from several decades ago, 
what you're seeing on the on the bottom left is a sculpture by Kenneth Snelson. So those were the first artistic expressions of consecutive. So just as origami actually started as a way to create artistic shapes, people were not thinking at the initial time or, oh, I'm going to do mathematics. I'm going to create a complicated structure based on this. They were just thinking as an artistic expression. So you're seeing a consecutive sculpture where those uh, solid bars are being uh, held in self equilibrium through those uh, members, the very, very tiny uh, cables. Of course, uh, over the years, just as in origami, people have looked at uh, ways to model tensegrities and be able to exploit their properties to be able to modulate shape and stiffness or real structures. What you're seeing uh, on the bottom right is a Super Bowl uh, compliant tensegrity robot uh, that people from NASA, some spiral uh, in particular, uh, have looked into be able to use as planetary landers to, for a space exploration. So now that we know uh, what is origami and tensegrity, perhaps most of us are very familiar with origami, but I wanted to go also into tensegrity because many people uh, sometimes they do not know. Uh, so now that we know these two concepts, we're going to dive into four different topics where we apply origami and tensegrity into engineering applications. So the outline of this presentation uh, I'm going to go first over the design of deployable stackable structures. You're going to see that uh, what is that in a bit. So in that one, we're looking at uh, ways to deploy very complicated shapes for space applications, robotics, etc., from very, very small volumes. In the second topic, we're going to be looking at programmable self-foldable films where, where we use polymer, uh, polymer sheets that are fabricated in a very special way that we're going to be looking at in detail to be able to create a origami-based manufacturing and create a, a small scale structures uh, that are free form. Secondly, we're going to go into tensegrity, to two topics on tensegrity. The first one is going to be on how do we apply tensegrity to create a morphing wing that is more aerodynamically efficient and is very lightweight for aerospace applications, on manned air vehicles, etc. And the second one uh, on tensegrity is the design of tensegrity payload carriers. So we're going to, we want to create a tensegrity carrier. So basically a package that can carry a certain payload and protects it from uh, damage, uh, from impact and other type of vibrations, et cetera. So let's dive into the first topic. So the first topic is into the design of deployable stackable structures. So what you're seeing there is a rendering on one of our uh, stackable structures. By stackable, we mean that uh, we're going to grab the different panels forming the shape and we're going to stack them in a, you can think of as an accordion shape like that is going like this. You are seeing how this, uh, how this shape is the, the small stellated uh, dodecahedron is being stacked from its actual final shape into a very, very compact uh, form which you can later deploy at a later time. So let's look at how does this happen and how we were able to do that and do these uh, animations and simulations. First, we're going to uh, motivate a little bit. So motivations, of course, is that we want to create uh, origami structures that can save a space. You can think of as a structure that you can put in a very, very small container. So for example, a rocket. And later you deploy it in a space when you, wherever you want to deploy it. And at that, at that point, you are saving a lot of space and you're saving, for example, a lot of fuel and a lot of volume. Secondly, because origami, as you probably have seen from paper, can allow you to do very, very complicated shapes. So in this case, we're going to use the theory of origami to create these stackable structures in a general fashion where you can give a freeform shape and we're going to give you the stack that you need to create in order for you to create that final shape. An example in this case, you can see this uh, deployable antenna. Actually, this is work by myself and also from my, my PhD and a postdoc who uh, continued after me on this project on deployable antennas. So there we were creating a, an antenna which can be deployed for a very complex configuration and be able to then adjust its electromagnetic properties. This is other application. So we can use this stackable uh, origami structures. Uh, in order to create a deployable robots. And finally, we can start using it for the biomedical field in order to create, a, for example, a stance, which these stents, 
you put them inside the body and then out of a, because they are made out of a shape memory alloy which activates with temperature, they expand inside your artery and allows you to have a better circulation if you're having some issues uh, with that. And of course, uh, we have further applications as we were talking about. So for example, deployable flashers where you can put in a very small compact configuration. We can also have emergency shelters if we want to think about having a shelter which you can transport in a very small container and then deploy it wherever you want to have a shelter, whether it can be for the military or in, in emergency applications. And also uh, some inspiration from uh, Brigham Young University who have developed bulletproof uh, shields that are deployable from Oregon. Perfect. Uh, so now let's go into the concept and methodology of the deployable stackable structures. So here we're at the high level, what we're given is a, a target shape, which is represented as a polyhedron mesh. So how do we obtain an stackable structure from this target shape? First, uh, we want to create a set of cuts in this target shape that allows us to find a single strip that can go over the entire shape of the structure. So in this case, for the truncated icosahedron, also having the same topology of a soccer ball, we are able to create a set of cuts that can go over the entire shape and create a single strip where the single strip we can then stack in an accordion shape in a very small container and then be able to deploy it into the target shape. So you can think of us starting with a polyhedral shape, in this case, format of pentagons and hexagons. Then the challenge is to find what are those cuts. So in this case, the highlighted edges show you where the cuts go to be in your shape and be able then to deploy it into a single strip that you can later stack in each phase, one on top of each other. If this stack is put in a container, just as the sky blue uh, box that you see on the top right, and then you open the box and this structure is able to deploy free to its target shape, you're able to see a folding motion where you go from the small, very compact shape and deploy into a target shape that in this case corresponds to the, to the soccer ball. So this is how the method works. We start from the target shape, we go get the cuts, once we have a set of cuts, we're able to put it into the stack shape and then we're able to then look at the folding motion of this structure. So in this case, uh, you can think of as defaults not being as creases as you normally see in a conventional paper origami where your folds are very, uh, very sharp. <clears throat> you were looking at the structures that have real thickness and have, are made of uh, functional uh, engineering materials. We want to look at folds that are made of, as can be idealized as three-dimensional shells. These three-dimensional shells, in order for this application to work, they need to be created in such a way that the stable shape is the one that they're going to be having at the target shape. So in this case, you can think of as having this structure uh, where you create the folds in this configuration. So whenever you stack it, into the very compact form, they are not in the most uh, lowest, energy, uh, lowest energy state. So you can put them in a container and then once you release them from the container, they go into the target chain. So how do we quantify it? So this elastic, ma um, elastic material, so this equation is valid for elastic plates, just as we're idealizing the different folds in other structures. The Eastern energy of the fold, in this case is called U, is formed by different com components. Uh, the derivation, of course, is skipped. So you will have the Young's modulus, which tells you how uh, the slope of the stress and the strain uh, of this material, the width of the fold, the angle change, uh, the height of the fold or fold thickness, and the length of the fold. And it will start quantifying this strain energy in the case where the folds are created in the self-equilibrated shape such as this one, 
we can plot the total strain energy once you go from the stack shape, which is the highest strain energy co configuration, and once and how the strain energy decreases as you go into the target shape. There are different criteria that we can think of for a stack configuration. One of them is what is called the shape accuracy. In this case, we measure the shape accuracy to be the ratio of the area of the target shape over the area of the trim shape. So what is the trim shape? So as you remember, when we were putting in our target shape into our code, our target shape was made out of a bunch of polygons connected through the edges. However, when we start introducing these smooth foldings, or smooth folds, as I was as I was as I was showing before, they are not creases because they are made out of real materials that have a finite thickness. So, in order for us to accommodate those folds, we need to be able to cut the mesh into a particular shape, and then. Uh, that decreases the total actually functional area of the structure. So you see, for example, this hexagon now has become a smaller hexagon over here. And of course, the, <coughs> that is uh, quantifying in our case uh, through the shape accuracy. So ideally, the shape accuracy is a parameter of your stacking that you want to maximize. So in this case, we see that the area of the target shape in this case is 2614 centimeters square, while for this case is is a little bit smaller, it's 2535, because certain areas were cut by introducing folds. Another parameter that in this case we want to minimize for practical applications is the volume of the stack. So how do we quantify the volume of the stack? There are multiple ways. You can think of as the minimum enclosing cylinder, minimum enclosing sphere. In this case, we quantify it as the minimum enclosing rectangular prism. So we put them into a prism box. In order for us to quantify what will be the, mini, the minimum enclosing rectangular prism, we go and look at the convex hole of this structure. So we put the stack into, a, and we try to find what is the, will be the minimum convex hole that we can use in order for us to put this box into the into a prism. <clears throat> now, uh, we go into looking into, uh, into our mesh coding approach. So as I was saying earlier, in order for us to be able to obtain a stacking, we need to find which edges of the target shape we want to cut in order for us to obtain the very long strip, the one that was shown in the previous slides. So, so in order for us to do it, uh, we use an approach that finds what is called the Hamiltonian path. The Hamiltonian path is a path that goes through each phase of these uh, polyhedrons, whether it can be the cube, truncated icosahedron or any other arbitrary polyhedron. And it travels through each phase of the polyhedron, passing only once through each phase. And after we are able to find the minimum enclosing, uh, sorry, the Hamiltonian path of the, of, the, of the structure, we're able to again look at which edges we need to cut. So in this case, these are set of different set of cuts that are included. So for example, you can see the different boundaries that you need to cut in order to obtain a single strip that passes through the entire cube. Similar situation where you have to go into finding a single strip that goes through the entire truncated icosahedron or soccer ball. Also for the small stellated dodecahedron, you can see the different cuts. And if you travel through the to all the faces that are not cut, you are able to find a single strip that goes through the entire shape. Similar uh, interactions happen when we look into the turtle, the cup, baby dinosaur, bunny, or para parabolic antenna. We also look at different folding approaches. When we have the stack, this very, very compact uh, form, there are two different ways that you can deploy it. 
One of them is to look at the uniform unfolding. In this case, it's exactly what, ha what I have been describing previously, that you just have the uh, stack in a very high strain, strain energy configuration, and when and you put it into a container, and whenever you release it from the container, the stack aromatically is going to go through its minimum strain energy configuration, which corresponds to the target shape. That's what we call the uniform unfolding. Another one is a more control type of folding, which is uh, the sequential one. Here, we start deploying each one of the folds individually in order for us to go from the stack shape and individually put each one of the uh, faces of the stack uh, together. This one uh, requires some control because it requires you to be able to sequentially go and unfold each one of the different edges to form your structure. There are also multiple challenges associated with the stackings. In this case, you can see folding intersections. So if you right now just leave it and you create a stack using our code of a certain target shape and you're able to obtain the stack, if you release it and you do a simulation where you look at how this structure is going to act, you see that sometimes you run into this situation where you have a intersections throughout the uh, unfolding form. So this is very important because we need to take them into account when we're putting this into a practical application or creating a prototype, because sometimes, uh, especially as you go into comp more complicated shapes like non-convex shapes, you can have these uh, occurrences of folding intersection. This is an example of the cube. So we always go and put a very simple uh, shape. So in this case, uh, you can see the sequential unfolding uh, of the cube. On the top left, you can see your target shape. <clears throat> At the same scale, you can see the stacking of the cube. So this is how it looks whenever it is stacked. This is how it looks in the zoom in uh, form. And this is an animation on how does the cube goes from the stack configuration to the target shape. In, through uh, the sequential unfolding. So you unfold each one of the edges individually. This is another example. So this is the truncated icosahedron. So this is the target, uh, this is the target shape of it. Uh, it's reminiscent of the soccer ball made out of pentagons and hexagons. And uh, this is the target shape. What you're seeing there, the highlighted edges, are those that are being cut to be able to form the stack. And this is a zoom in view of the stack uh, right in the middle. So it shows uh, the minimum enclosing container. And on the right, you see the complex uh, motion that the, that the truncated icosahedron has to go to go from the compact uh, stack configuration to the target. Uh, spherical looking configuration. This is an example of the small stellated uh, icosahedron. I just call it the star, but <laughs> it, it has a, a specific name in the uh, polyhedron language. So again, you see the target shape and you see the stacking. In this case, it's made out of triangles, all of them the same size. And this is how it looks whenever you put it in the stack form. And what you're seeing on the right is actually a, a shape that was shown uh, earlier. Is how it looks uh, in a rendering once it is animated, going from the stack configuration to the target shape. This is an example of a parabolic antenna. So here you are seeing a bowl made out of tri triangles, uh, simulating a parabolic shape. And this is how it looks whenever it is in the stacked compact form. Again, the minimum enclosing box and the associated animation of how it looks whenever you deploy it. <laughs> this is my favorite, it's baby dinosaur. So uh, this is the target shape of baby dinosaur. You see the small body and the big head. And you see also the different cuts that you had to make in order for you to obtain a single strip that goes through the entire shape of baby dinosaur. 
And this is how it looks uh, in the stack form. You see the stack form is a little bit complex because you end up having faces that are of different sizes. And this is what happens, of course, whenever you have a more complicated shape with different faces, your stacking is not as uh, nice and uniform as you normally will, will see for like the uh, cube, the truncated icosahedron, and, others, and other type of shapes. So, and this is what you see on the right, uh, how the, the uniform deformation goes going from the stack shape into the baby dinosaur uh, target shape. Similarly, we can see other shapes such as the bunny, just going a little fast uh, over this because this is uh, another one more example showing how we can do uh, shapes that are non-convex and have a large number of faces. In this case, 100 faces forming the bunny. And this is the turtle. And you can see also the different edges that go through the shape of the turtle and how it looks whenever it animates from the initial shape to the target shape. This is of course uh, very important. So this is another, another uh, aspect uh, of whenever of finding the stackings. You can imagine having a polyhedron, in this case, the bony, or you can think of any type of polyhedron. You have a very, very large number of different uh, unfoldings that you can do. Here, what we're showing is that not every unfolding will have the same quality, if you will. In this case, we're showing the volume of the minimum enclosing prism for different stackings. You can see this one has like 0 0.59 meters cube and they decrease up to like 0 0.42 meters cube. So in order for us to be able to find the stacking for a practical application, we need to look into the optimization of the particular uh, criterion, uh, optimization criterion that we want to uh, use. So just to summarize this topic, uh, we're looking at deployable stackable structures that uh, form by a strip unfoldings, that's what we call the strip unfolding. In this case, they're not unfolded into a plane as in regular origami, but rather they are folded into a compact stack of multiple faces in an accordion fashion. We have done it for different shapes, which can be made of triangles or any polygon. Uh, can have more than 100 faces, we can even go to 1,000. Uh, of course, the computational complexity of unfolding the stacking can be uh, decreased highly. It works for convex and non-convex shapes, and we can do volume minimization through optimization, as well as other criteria that I talked about before. So of course, we're looking into a strain energy deployment simulation using Abacus, which is a finite element software, looking into the issue of folding intersections, and also fabrication of prototypes. This is the second uh, topic I would like to touch on. Uh, this one, we go into programmable self-foldable films. <clears throat> for origami-based manufacturing. In this case, uh, we're looking at the small scales. So we're looking at being into millimeters, so millimeter sizes. And this is a collaboration with a professor here at the University of California, Terrabine, Professor Mario Madiu, uh, who is working on the experimental uh, side of this uh, work. So in origami manufacturing, uh, as he was saying before, it allows us to create very complex shapes. And an advantage that it can have also in manufacturing is that it allows for relatively simple construction because it is just based uh, on folding different edges to create your target shape. And also, if we're looking at man also in manufacturing, minimal material consumption is very important. When we're doing a 3D printing or other freeform manufacturing techniques, sometimes we have a lot of uh, residual material that is not being used. In the case of origami, you can start with a planar shape, just cut it out, and then fold it into the uh, target shape that you want to have. For the small scales, we are looking at different applications uh, to for us to motivate the creation of a small scale polymer structures, which include three-dimensional electronics. It can also include encapsulation of objects at the small scales, micro grippers, so Similar to encapsulation, this one will grab a particular object, uh, micro mirrors and scaffolds to create uh, complex shapes that can be changed, change their shape into a particular target, towards a particular target at the smaller scale. So there are different challenges that happens whenever you go into manufacturing at the smaller scales. 
One of them is that on like folding paper, uh, we cannot do manual folding. So we cannot just grab our hands and uh, go with our hands and grab the paper and fold it because it will be like super tiny, millimeters, so millimeters scale. And the fabrication process can be super complex. And also the fabrication sometimes uh, in the literature is just product specific. So the way that uh, we're approaching this is through a self-folding origami. By self-folding, we means that the structure is going to fold itself and we're going to see how does that happen. So how can we have a structure that can fold uh, on its own rather than having us with our hands or some other uh, external object applying forces to be able to fold it. Then uh, we also include a less fabrication, less complex fabrication process and allows us to, uh, and we want to also create a free form manufacturing route. So the way that we approach this problem is that we're going to go into very similar approaches just as we did for the stacking uh, problem. We're going to be given a certain target shape that you want to create in this case on the small scales. Then we're going to use origami um, algorithms. This one is the one that is included in my published book where we have a, a smooth foldings, which is very important because in this case, we're going to be looking at polymer structures that are just as we look at the stackable structures, they are not going to have folds that are creases, but are rather going to have folds that are smooth. Then this unfolded target shape is going to be the template that we're going to use to create a planar shape that will have a specific regions that are folds and faces. So the blue and the, so the yellow and the green. And then through a specific fabrication procedure, we're going to be able to create the polymer structure. There are different self-folding approaches that people have been using in the, in the past. And this one is buckling based. So in this case, you have a substrate at the bottom. You put your sheet bonded at a specific regions on your substrate. And the substrate in this case can be silicon based and then can be uh, shrunk again and be able to allow to, the structure to buckle and create the target shape. And another approach is to use surface tension. So at the smaller scales, you can put a liquid on top of a solid. And at that point, because uh, inertia, et cetera, uh, mass uh, is, not be, is not that dominant as, the, as in the larger scales, surface tension can actually bring the structure to close as you can see in the video. And of course, you can also use a multi-layer uh, fabrication where you have two materials that expand differently, you bond them together, and that allows you to have folding deformation at different directions. In our approach, uh, we circumvent a lot of issues with fabrication at the small scale by using a single layer photopolymer films. I'm going to go in what photopolymer is, but at the high level, it is a polymer that uh, changes its properties by application of UV light in this case. And we use a single layer. We have controlled uh, folding. So we're able to have a folding, uh, folding approach that allows us to uh, predict with very high accuracy how is our structure going to fold at the smallest scales without our intervention. And we're creating an end-to-end -end man manufacturing method. So in this case, uh, the manufacturing methods start with a target shape that you would like to use for your application. And it goes all the way as in the previous diagram, it goes from the deployment of the target shape into a planar sheet then the fabrication of a polymer planar sheet with that shape, and then folding of the planar sheet into the target. The folding mechanism, just going uh, at the high level over it, uh, is based on this uh, transport of substances. So in this case, the polymer films, that is a single layer, it has faces and folds. The folds, as you will see in a little bit why, uh, will have a smaller stiffness and a, a, a smaller uh, cross-linking concentration. Once uh, you immerse it to development where the bottom side of the sheet is attached to a substrate, in this case, a PDMS substrate, the liquid goes inside the polymer sheet and has a higher concentration on the top. So it, it so it is able to get rid of non cross link polymer chains. This liquid is called developer. That's why this action is called development. 
Then the film is separated from the substrate. So you grab the sheet and you separate it from the substrate and then you heat it up. Once it is heated up, the liquid that has been absorbed in this case called developer uh, is evaporated from the sheet. Since the developer, you have higher concentration of it at the top of the sheet, the sheet will shrink on the top and you're able, going to be able to obtain a folding. So in this case, it will bend and you're able to, to do that. So how are we going to do this? Uh, this is a summary of the fabrication. We start with a silicon wafer. We deposit a PDMS coating, uh, and then we deposit SU8, which is for is for photopolymer, which I was mentioning before. Will change its stiffness by application of UV light. Then we perform two different UV exposures. One of them we expose the folds and the faces. So. Think about this photopolymer <clears throat> as the more UV light that you apply to it, the more stiff the polymer becomes. So the first thing that we do is that we expose both the folds and the faces. Secondly, in the UV exposure number two, we expose only the faces. So what happens in this case? So if we expose first the folds and the faces, but then we expose the faces a little bit more, the faces are going to be stiffer and you can think was more rigid than the folds because you only want to have the folding deformation only at the fold regions. And then everything, all the extra stuff that wasn't being exposed to UV light is very soft and liquid and it gets removed through a process called post-exposure baking. Then we proceed to grab the free standing polymer film and heating it up to be able to obtain the target shape. This is our mask uh, look in real life. So you can think of us just grabbing our results from our origami design code and be able to put, you put them into a, a in this case, a plastic, a, a, a plastic template and you print out uh, the target shape. So this is how we do the exposure. So wherever you, wherever you see black, UV light is not going to pass through it. So UV light is only going to pass through the transparent regions. So this template, uh, you can see different shapes, exposes uh, the folds and the faces. In the second uh, template, we expose the, face, uh, the faces only. So you see that the fold regions are now covered in black. That's how we do the two exposure uh, cases. So how do we do a predictable folding? Uh, how can we get predictable folding behavior? So in this case, uh, we do what is called fold angle programming. First, uh, we create different samples that only have a single fold. And we change the width of the fold. By changing the width of the fold, which in this case is W, and in this case we normalize, normalize it by the field thickness, we are able to uh, measure what is the fold angle that you're going to obtain as the sheet, um, as you change the ratio of the width of the folds to the field thickness. And what you're seeing here are different data points for different thicknesses in, over here. And we observed uh, from the experimental data that there is good agreement between a linear, uh, between a linear curve fit and the and the experimental data points. So we're able to now uh, have a relation between the width and the thickness of the folds and the and the achievable fold angle. So we use that relation in order for us to be able to create uh, folds that we know exactly that they will fold at a particular angle. So for example. If you want uh, your fold to, to reach 90 degrees, so to be exactly 90 degrees, you go to 90, you trace a horizontal line, and then you see where does it touches the co linear core fit, and that tells you exactly what width you need to use for your fold. Of course, all of this is uh, automated. So in the unfolding polyhedra method, we start with a target mesh, in this case, we do a set of cuts 
uh, that will allow us to deploy it in this case, not to a stacking, but to a planar shape. Then we trim the mesh, just as we learned from the stacking that these folds are going to occupy a certain area. So they're uh, going to be uh, a finer region. And all these different, uh, you see these blue regions, they will have a width that is specific for that fold angle that you want to achieve. Finally, uh, you get you use the uh, templates, those uh, black and transparent uh, templates, in order for you to obtain a polymer film that resembles your planar net. These are some shape examples. So here, uh, all of these are uh, just as a, also a, as a, a small and. Uh, fact, uh, all of this is created through modifications of the codes that I had in my, I had in my book, where we look at the smooth folding. And now we're able to integrate the cal experimentally calibrated curve like that you saw with the experimental data. And now we're able to create shape examples. So this is what is inputted. It's basically a mesh, a bunch of uh, polygons forming a structure. These are deployed into a planar form. Uh, the widths of the green regions, which are the folds, uh, are specific for that specific target shape. And this is how they look uh, once they are fabricated. So here you see the, how, what is predicted by the uh, software. And you see the fabricated shape. So this pyramid with a hexagonal base, this uh, bowl over here, and the dodecahedron formed by pentagon faces over here. And you see that there is a, a very fair agreement between what is predicted by the code once it is calibrated and what happens at the small scales, uh, in this case, kind of millimeter type of scale uh, for these shapes. So just summarizing uh, the second topic, uh, where we look in this case at programmable self-folding polymer films. Uh, in this case, we uh, use a uh, solvent transport based uh, cell folding. So we use that solvent transport to be able to use a single sheet that is able to obtain folding deformation. And we are able to develop this manufacturing platform that goes from end to end, where one end is your target shape. And on the other end, you have your fabricated shape at the small scales. And we have demonstrated the method with different shapes. And of course, for summary purposes, I didn't show all of them, but that's how they look. And in ongoing work, uh, we're looking at a new bi-directional folding strategy, because as you notice right now, we can only fold into one direction. We can only fold up. We want to look at how can we are able to fold down to be able to do non-convex shapes and other type of a, um, a wide variety of, diff of target shapes. And we're looking also into the multi-physics characterization of the folded film. So we're looking into the stiffness, electromagnetic properties, et cetera. Now, uh, I'm going to go into the last topic for timing purposes. So in the last topic, we're going to look at integrity, which we learned earlier uh, what it is. So we see, a, we know that it is a set of bodies that is going to be self-equilibrated through uh, one dimensional members, in this case, strings, to be able to create a morphing wing. So some motivation and applications of this is that a current inefficiencies in aircraft sometimes occur whenever you have separated control surfaces. You can think of as when you have entered an airplane, you see different ailerons and flaps, et cetera, that, you, that the wing has. So this introduces discontinuities, which at the high level, what they do is that they can increase the drag in the structure, which the drag force in outer space engineering is a force that you can think of as the airplane moving forward. That is the force of the air, aerodynamic force that is trying to push it the other way as it is moving. So that includes a separated control surfaces. So that is a source of inefficiency. And another one is that the support structure is, uh, can be quite heavy. So obviously having a higher weight uh, introduces a higher uh, cost, a higher fuel usage and higher emissions. So in our case, we want to use a morphing wing approach in this case that the wing is going to change its shape without any control surfaces. It's not going to be a bunch of rigid, face, rigid uh, objects moving together, but rather a single shape that is going to be smooth and is going to change its shape and replace the legacy support structure with a lightweight and segregated structure. This has been looked at uh, in different approaches. So NASA and MIT look at this MADCAT uh, wing that is made out of internal cellular structure. 
we also look at the uh, people have also looked at AFRL and flexes into the flex foil design. And also MIT and NASA have looked at these uh, morphing wing concepts uh, for quite some time. In this case, uh, first in our approach, we want to compare the conventional uh, wing. In this case, we compare a conventional wing with a flap. Uh, to the tensegrity twisting wing, because we want to prove first that a twisting wing can have a higher aerodynamically, a higher aerodynamic efficiency than the twisting wing, than, than the conventional wing. So here we define two different parameters. In this case, is the angle of attack. That is the angle that the wing makes with the free stream velocity. So in this case, you can think of as the airplane moving horizontally along the blue dotted line. And that angle of attack will be the angle that the wing makes with respect to it. And the second angle is the angle that the flap makes with respect to this line, the line, the core line that connects the front and the back points of the wing. The twisting wing does not require a flap, but rather goes from a torsional deformation. So one end you can think of as fixed and the other one can rotate in this direction as you, um, as the wing is, is deforming and changing its aerodynamic um, properties. So again, we will have an angle of attack. And now instead of having a flat deflection angle, we will have a twist angle. So the angle that the one end makes with respect to the other. So here we're looking at the tensegrity wing aerodynamic performance. So what you're seeing here is a contour plot of lift over drag. This is a measure that is used to quantify aerodynamic efficiency. So the lift force, you can think of as your airplane moving forward. The lift force is the force that is keeping the airplane moving, uh, uh, staying up. So the weight goes down. Lift force is the aerodynamic force that uh, goes against the weight to keep the airplane flying. And drag, as I mentioned, is the fo aerodynamic force that goes against the motion of your uh, aircraft. So you, you want high lift, low drag. So you can see the contour plot of leaf over drag when you have a flap deflection angle on the vertical axis and an angle of attack in the horizontal. This is how the leaf over drag looks for the uh, tensegrity uh, twisting wing. So here you can see that the conventional wing was able to reach up to like 10.5 uh, leaf over drag coefficient, uh, leaf over drag. In this case, uh, the tensegrity twisting wing reaches those values way earlier for very low angles of attack. So therefore, we're able to see that the aerodynamic efficiency of the tensegrity twisting wing is way higher than the conventional wing with flaps. So now the question is, how are we going to be able to move the wing in, into torsion? So the way that we do it uh, we, is that we introduce a tensegrity mechanism that at the same time, not only allows the motion, but also allows for a very lightweight and flexible solution. So you can see here in a finite element simulation of our wing and how, it's such, how it achieves torsional deformation. This end is fixed and this end is uh, twisting. And here you see the torsional tensegrity mechanism. So in this case, you see that this end is fixed and this end is, is twisting and these two pictures are the same. The only thing I did here is that I will remove the skin so you can see what is happening in the interior of the wing. The tensegrity uh, twisting wing has different components. So let's take a look at it a little bit closer. You will have the ribs. This one gives the aerodynamic shape of the wing. You will have a central spire. This one gives you bending deformation so the wing doesn't start bending once it, you start having aerodynamic forces, etc., cetera, on, uh, apl being applied to it. And we have rings that provides a stability into the structure. So these ones are connected through cables, as you will see in a bit, uh, to be able to keep the whole system concentric and not moving uh, into other directions. This is a front view of the different cables. You will see the longitudinal wires. These are just elastic wires that are uh, restoring uh, wires, you will see in a bit. The actuator wires, these ones are a little, as you notice, uh, they're a little bit off axis because these ones, when they shrink, they will start, you can think of as trying to become as straight as possible in horizontal. So they will start twisting that wing section. And the other ones are the stabilizer wires, which uh, pretty much keep the entire structure in a stable shape. So keep everything concentric and not, and keep them from moving into an off axis configuration. 
This is how it looks, uh, the tensegrity mechanism in a finite element simulation. Uh, the actuator wires uh, are undergoing a shrinkage, which can be done through material actuation if you are, they are composed of shape memory alloys, or they can be spooled through a motor uh, in the other end of the wing. This is a prototype that was fabricated by uh, undergraduate students here at UC Irvine uh, two years ago. It's a functional prototype that has actually a motor on the other side that was able to shrink the actuator wires and allow motion of this twisting wing with using the principle that I just described. And here, uh, over, going over our last slides, uh, we just present a design of experiment um, story where we look at the influences of different design parameters on the stresses in the structure, on the maximum twist angle that you can achieve, and on the mass of the structure. So here, uh, the structural response, we uh, assess it through Abacus finite element uh, analysis. Uh, we parameterize the whole model using Python, so everything is coded, so you can change uh, different parameters. We're going to see it in a bit. And then we look at different design constraints. So for example, material failure. So now uh, different design variables. So you see the different number of cells. So this one has two cells, this one has four cells, six cells. Those are design variables that you can are able to change. And also the different number of wire sets. So how many sets of wires uh, form these circumferential torsional mechanisms? So in this case, you see very little number, three wire sets, four wire sets, six wire sets. We have other design variables, uh, just as the diameter of the central spar, the thickness of the ribs and the materials forming the ribs. You see here all the different mm -hmm. options, including aluminum and titanium. You also see the skin and different materials forming the skin and the materials forming the actuator wires and their diameters. Here, uh, just a visualization of our finite element mesh and the different boundary conditions. So in order for us to simulate the structure, we fix the wing root at one end and we apply a aerodynamic pressure uh, throughout the entire wing skin. So the structure is able to, uh, so this uh, structure is undergoing actual realistic loads that will occur whenever it is, under, uh, it is actually being morphed in practice. These are some main effects plots. Uh, going a little brief because of the timing, so to allow some Q&A. So just going uh, briefly. So here, this just showing the effects of variating the diameter of the actuator wires. We see that the higher the diameter it is, we have the, uh, we actually found that the twist angle uh, will increase. However, you will have some issues because it will also increase your mass. Uh, increasing the thickness of the skin, of course, will uh, allow you, will make you increase your mass. However, we found that for in, uh, the skin thickness, there is like a very nice, uh, uh, there, are, uh, th there are two very nice ends at the minimum and maximum values. That allows you to maximize the twist angle that the wing can undergo. And this is just a, a, a rendering of for finite element simulation of the most favorable design. Here you see it's made out of uh, five cells. So five different uh, sections divided by uh, the ribs, six wire sets. And these are the materials. So the skin was made out of LDPE. The wires made out of titanium and the spar ribs and rings, uh, again, out of an, another type of titanium. So just to summarize this, this topic, uh, we look at a parameterized finite element model for the twisting wing. And we also look at this uh, wing can undergo a twist angle of 19.5 degrees. So you can think as the root and the tip being twisted by 19.5 degrees relative to one another without any material failure. So it shows that uh, this concept can allow you to have high deformations uh, under realistic uh, conditions. And we, def we identify also critical design drivers. In ongoing work, we are looking into prototyping and wind tunnel testing of our concept. Now that you already saw that we have a prototype, but that's more like a tabletop prototype. We're now looking into testing the, the wing into an actual wind tunnel and looking at the actuation mechanism. 
So here, uh, let one moment, let me skip the <laughs> last topic because so it go into the end. Uh, oh. So in another summary, we have looked uh, into origami and tensegrity approaches to, to apply them into aerospace structures and manufacturing. And we look at three different topics. I skip the last one because of a uh, timing to allow some Q&A. Uh, we look at the design of deployable stackable structures for aerospace applications, robotics, uh, etc. We look at programmable self foldable fields for fabrication at the smaller scales. And we also look at how do we use tensegrity concepts to be able to, man to manufacture and synthesize a, a morphing wing that can have a motion, can change its leaves and, and drag properties without requiring uh, control surfaces as conventional wings, and therefore will allow you to have a higher aerodynamic, higher aerodynamic efficiency. And because it is made out of a very lightweight mechanism, it will be uh, have very low mass. So before I finalize it, I would like to thank uh, all of you for your attention. I hope that this was uh, very educational for everybody. Uh, that is the website of, our, of my research group. So it's morphing dot eng dot uci dot edu and of course uh, this work is not done by myself it's done by a lot of individuals that you can see in the picture so my graduate students uh, we have six graduate students in the group right now and several undergraduate students which uh, these are the current active ones so uh, did I include the names because the not will be super small and of course uh, that that's me the principal investigator of the group uh, Edwin Hernandez and that's my email if you have any questions or comments, and I will be very happy to, to answer and, and, and meet you. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Thank you, Edwin, for a very nice talk. Um, audience members, this is time for questions. You can unmute your uh, speaker and ask, or if you have to uh, type it in the chat, I we can answer that as well. So uh, if you have to uh, uh, eventually transition the flexi wing into an actual, um, in other words, it's getting regulatory approval for a, a flexi wing. How long does that, do you expect that to take? I mean, will you retire before that happens or? Well, uh, that, that uh, from my experience, I haven't done it myself, but I have seen uh, people going through that. Uh, that is something, uh, especially now going into regulations, et cetera, is something that can take decades uh, sometimes uh, because you have to go into uh, several regulations. You have to meet, uh, you have to go into to multiple tests, demonstrations, et cetera. So for this, uh, for this, for this to eventually be applied to an actual structure, as you probably guessed, I, I will be like like pretty old, most likely. <laughs> uh, hopefully not retired. <laughs> but, well, but yeah, um, uh, yes. If you, uh, if you try the, uh, I mean, would this would this uh, be less regulatory uh, uh, for drones, where you'd only have to convince Google that you. Yeah, you won't crash their shipments and things like that. Uh, yes, actually, one of our main targets uh, for the tensegrity twisting wing is not uh, exactly large commercial aircraft or military aircraft, but it's rather a uh, unmanned aircraft, which, as you uh, just guessed, uh, will perhaps be uh, more easily applicable to uh, uh, probably in the shorter term into an actual uh, application because many people can have uh, are, can probably try their own experimental uh, procedures. Uh, but yes, uh, our goal is a uh, somewhat uh, near term goal is to eventually be able to propose this. Once we follow all the uh, test testing procedures, as, as I was mentioning, going through wind tunnel testing and eventually testing the morphing into prototype, to be able to transition it into a man, a small aircraft. Edwin, this is Sachi. Uh, Hello. Sorry to pull you back to more mundane things, but coming to your foldable stackable structures, you mentioned optimization. 
Yes. Can you elaborate? Because I wasn't sure when you say optimization, at what level uh, there's, there's, once you decide your facet, the order in which you want to unfold the, the, the cuts that you make is an optimization problem in and of itself. But in a step prior to it, how you, do you change the facets on this? Is that included in your optimization? Uh, that's a very excellent comment. Uh, right now at the level that we have it uh, at our current stage, uh, the target shape, which in this case is the set of facets and their connections, et cetera, is given to us. So okay. we have in, uh, we have, in order for us to include it, we'll have to go one step for, uh, back, which is to be able to then be given a certain target shape and then create the mesh and then input it into our, into our code. Right now, the mesh in our uh, current approach is given to us. So the connections between the different faces, et cetera, the node positions and the connectivity is given. And what we optimize is the which edges we're going to be, uh, so the optimization variables is basically which edges are going to be cut and which ones are going to be fault in order for us to be able to uh, optimize certain criteria, which for example, can be the volume of the stack, the accuracy of the stack, and of course, with constraints that we do not have self intersections whenever it's, it is unfolding. So that's our current approach. But uh, in the in the future, we are planning to go into also not only starting with a given shape, given mesh, but going one step uh, above, which is starting with a target shape, then optimize the mesh, and then uh, input it into this uh, into this uh, into this optimi into this secondary optimization approach. So, so this is a discrete variable by objective optimization then for you? Yes, uh, right now uh, or, or variables, if we go in, into that, each uh, at the high level, each one of your edges in your target shape will be assigned either a zero or a one. If it is a zero, it will be a fault. If it is a one, it is a cut. And then, uh, so basically your number of variables is going to be your number of edges. And we're using a generic algorithm to, de to define which ones they are because the constraint of course is that they have to form a, a single road, a single strip over the entire shape. Uh, as we were mentioned in this slide. Okay. And then there's the permutation part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So first challenge is how to find the set of cuts that actually give you a strip. Uh, that takes uh, quite a long time because uh, it needs to be very special to be able to give you that. And secondly, once you have a strip, you will have multiple of them. So which one gives you the uh, minimum volume, which one gives you the highest accuracy, and which one doesn't give you uh, intersections during folding. Okay. So one of the things you mentioned, I think I see that on the side on the intersections are what I would consider interlocking. Do you optimize it for avoiding that interlocking at the moment or? Uh, right now it is a constraint. So when we have a non-folding, we go into just a, this is a kinematic simulation as I was mentioning in my future work, it's actually undergoing a uh, performing finite element simulations considering uh, the material behavior, et cetera. Right now it's just kinematic. So we assume a uniform unfolding. So once we have a stack, we simulate the all the steps when it goes from the stack to the target shape and we detect any intersections uh, we discard that uh, stacking so it's part of an, a constraint so once you have a stacking you check if you have intersections if it has intersections it is uh, we just put a very high penalty and say that is not good for uh, for the application okay so it, it's you're not tailoring the joint uh, strain energy density for, uh, to control your unfolding? Uh, no, not at this moment. Right now, we're just assuming a uniform unfolding from the stack shape into the target shape. But as I was mentioning uh, later on, uh, we're looking into actually designing each one of the faults, in this case could be the thickness, the material, et cetera, to be able to avoid the situations and have you know more flexibility in our designs. Right now, the faults are made out of the same thickness and the same material for, you know, for our initial exploration. Okay, very nice. 
Nice. I have a lot of questions, but I will yield the floor to others since we're a little bit past the hour. Yeah, I, I, I see there one. one in, there is oh, one in the chat. Yeah, I, I can read it. No worry. So, a uh, court uh, is asking for the same target shape. It seems that there is a multiple origami solutions. That's totally right. If so, how do you determine which is best fit? I.e., based on the Lisa Mano surfaces. That's a great. Uh, uh, that's a great question. So let me go back to let me go to this slide. So in this case, we are given the shape of a bunny, a mesh uh, of a of a rabbit, and as our friend uh, Cord is mentioning, um, and totally right, you can have multiple. Uh, in this case, it's actually a factorial number based on the number of faces. So it's for a bunny of 100 faces, is millions of different strip unfoldings. And the question is, uh, how do we determine which one is the best fit? So we have a different optimization criteria. One of them is to minimize, is the minimization of the volume of the stacking. So as you notice, each one of the set of uh, strips will have a different volume. As you can see here, the, this, one, uh, this one has volume of 0 0.59 meter cube. This one has 0 0.54, these are just examples. And the actual one that we're going to be including is the one that gives you the minimum volume. This uh, is just one of the optimization criteria. You can also look at the one that gives you the highest accuracy or other, uh, or doesn't give you intersections or other criteria that you would like to include. So when you have the different stackings that the optimizer is determining, you look at your objective function, which can be in this case, minimizing volume. And that's how you select which one uh, gives you the, which one you can assume to be your optimal stacking. But also you can do a, a multi-criteria. You can use several yes. criteria and mm -hmm. that will be more interesting. Yes, definitely. So uh, moving into multi-objective is definitely a, an excellent uh, subsequent step. Edwin, this is Sachi again. This may be a stupid question. I, I'm failing to see where you get the height vari height variations that you show. If you have a hundred faces and you have the edges, shouldn't you just have hundred stacks, hundred layers with whatever the joint thickness is adding to the stack? Or are you- Yes, uh, that's totally true. To vary uh, in the height uh, dimension or is it just the way it's plotted? Uh, actually, the height is determined by two things. Uh, first of all, uh, the number of faces. So as you in, you are totally right, the number of faces will tell you with the number of floors. Uh, so for example, a cube will have six floors. However, something that you notice here is that not every uh, face is going to have, not every floor is going to have the same height. Why? Because defaults are sized through a particular algorithm. Uh, I think that, that is like I'll probably hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, didn't want to go over the entire equation. So here, uh, the false, the width of the false, which in this case is this uh, dimension, it has a function of a safety factor, the thickness of the false, the material properties of the false, yield strength, etc. Because in this case, we are uh, considering a false that do not a undergo stresses that are higher than their failure stress. That's why if any of these numbers is too large, uh, your widths are going to have different uh, uh, sizes. So that's what you see from the, from the, even from something simple like the cube, you see that this fold is like very thin, but this one's end up being very large. So those two things determine the total height of the stack. The uh, widths of your folds, which are determined from the material properties, uh, the deformation that they're going to go, their thickness, et cetera, and also how many faces you have, because that tells you how many floors. So here you see another one uh, with uh, the number of floors is given by the number of faces indeed. And how tall is this floor is depending on the width uh, of, the, of, the, of the actual uh, shape. So here, this one, you can see that it's super tall because uh, you have way more faces. Um, and of course, the size of the container that you're going to put them on uh, not only depends on the number of faces, but uh, the other two dimensions, like the planar dimensions, uh, depend on the no, non-uniformity of the faces. And this kind of ties to your uh, first question. 
where you said what will be the best mesh. Uh, uh, the best mesh is probably one that has the faces as uniform size as possible, like this one, because then we're seeing that things like baby dinosaur, that one has uh, faces that are, are all different angles or different shapes, and you end up having a lot of empty space in your stack because they are not one on top of each other exactly. You, they are uh, changing the spatial dimension. So yeah, I, I asked that question because on, on that one, there are some facets that are fairly large that could have been in turn folded, even if they unfold to a flat uh, 180 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. So like the face of the dinosaur has some very large triangles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let, let me read the other question from the chat. Uh, Jonathan is saying, uh, thank you for presenting Dr. Hernandez. Uh, I was wondering what is the, what the life cycle is like for this stackable structure. Is the idea to have one time formation or multiple depending on the material default? Uh, excellent question. So the way that we are uh, sizing defaults uh, going back to this one, is that you do not exceed a certain uh, stress on them when they are being stacked. In this case, we're assuming that is the yield strength. Uh, the yield strength uh, in engineering is just uh, that particular stress that if you go above that uh, is value, your structure is going to have permanent deformation. So it's not going to be the same once you unload it. So in this case, we're assuming that this is going to be an elastic and reversible unfolding where we are expecting it to be able to be repeated multiple times. That depends, of course, on the application. You want something that will deploy only once and you never want to stack it again. Uh, for example, you want to deploy like a certain satellite in space where you just want to stack it in order for you to launch it. And then you deploy it and you don't care about uh, uh, stack it again and bring it back. Uh, there you probably will have a lot more freedom in sizing your folds. In this case, we are assuming that uh, we are not going to exceed the failure stresses in the falls. Uh, however, uh, fatigue is a uh, life cycle is a completely different uh, situation. There you will have a certain stress that you cannot exceed in order for this to be able to undergo multiple cycles. So you will probably have, need to have a way bigger uh, falls that undergo even lower stresses than the strength value. Edwin, thank you for a very nice talk. I think we can continue answering questions, but there may be people that may have other things uh, they have on their calendar, so. Like finals. <laughs> yeah, so we can excuse the audience if they want oh, to. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm uh, totally you can ask questions, feel yeah. free to do so. Everyone has been asking uh, excellent questions and um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you, Edwin, for a very, very interesting talk. And so I want to wish everybody a great weekend. And so I want to finish a couple of things that I have to do here. So I'm going to leave you. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I'm looking thank forward you to very meeting nice to meet you. you. Yeah. Is this the last uh, cloak? Yes. For, for okay. the 2020 year. Yes. yes. Okay. So, I don't know, we're still here. Yes, I, I'm here. How, how does the origami community buy um, the terminology? Because my experience early on in origami was if you didn't have a convex sheet from which you folded, it wasn't origami, right? There was this. Oh, yes. Uh, that's, that that that's not origami. Um, and then I think I, I've been stuck in that mindset for a long time. And I, today I looked at your work and said, wow, it's a matter of folding one shape to another without having to start from the convex shape. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, and as, um, from what I have seen uh, and, you know, personal opinion on the evolution of this, uh, when I look at the papers of computational origami uh, from the you know, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, I look at the first uh, algorithms that people use to create, for example, shapes. And they normally start, okay, we're going to start with a square sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And then you have to create your, uh, uh, your pattern. And then uh, you are restricted to those things. However, however as I'm seeing uh, as things move into the future, uh, people are a lot less restrictive into the, into the research because we're thinking uh, if for a practical application, if it's better for me to deploy from a stack or is it better for me to deploy from a tube, 
or from other shape, uh, why will I have to go to the square shape, which is, of course, a mathematical restriction, uh, yeah. not, not uh, for most cases, a, a practical yeah. restriction. That, that restriction incredibly complicates your folders. Yes. Uh, if you don't, okay, you have to start from a square sheet and like, oh, well, <laughs> yeah. give me three years and maybe I can try to solve it, but I cannot promise anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you notice uh, most of these things do not end up, actually this one, for example, the stackings, uh, sometimes they cannot even be planar because you will have overlap. So you have to fabricate the stacking uh, form rather than a planar sheet. Uh, here where we look at the, um, these guys, uh, you see that when you start having these folds that are uh, very smooth, that are not creases, it's uh, impossible that we can say, oh, I'm going to start with a sheet that is square and <laughs> going to be able to <laughs> fabricate this, 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 this structure. So we start with uh, sheets that uh, already have the shape that we wanted because uh, having extra folds that go from a, a square sheet to, the, to these places, uh, not feasible for these particular scales and, and sizes. Right, yeah. I was going to ask you something about the deployment. I, 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 we had Robert Skelton here when he was still at UCSD give a talk on tensor integrity structures. And, oh, nice. Uh, he was my postdoc advisor uh, yeah. for, some, for, some, for some months, yes. Oh, ah, okay. So I, I remember from his talk, um, not exactly, but I, going from one configuration to the other he i remember talking about energy manifolds right because now you're in the space of these uh, each joint motion but you have to have this man in, in energy space in term, in that space your energy has to be a continuous uh, manifold to be able to move it smoothly when you do these deployments do you have such requirements or uh, not happen, in the particular but... example that I show for the for the wing, uh, that is for tensegrity. Uh, no, for, I mean for the origami unfolding itself. Uh, oh, the origami unfolding. You have some energy stored and you have to come out. Mm -hmm. The question is, what makes some configurations lock versus the other? I wondered if yes, uh, related that's... to that, there's a multi-stable uh, configuration plus there's the energy mm -hmm. of transition from one state to yeah. the other. In this case, uh, for the stackable structures, it's uh, not a multi-stable uh, approach. It's a, a single uh, stable configuration. Mm -hmm. So the way that they work uh, is that uh, if you were going to fabricate these folds, you fabricate them in a way that the rest configuration is at the uh, target shape. Mm -hmm. That means that the minimum energy of this structure is whenever you are at the target shape. So then if you grab this fold and you fold it to 180 degrees to make the stack, it's not in the minimum energy configuration. However, you can keep it in this shape by putting it in a container. Then once you release it from the container, it goes from the stack shape into the target shape just by minimization of the total strain energy of the structure, which means that the folds are going to go to their minimum energy shape, which is the one right at the final configuration. Uh, all that has been taken into account whenever we look at the sizing of defaults, etc. Uh, and that's how we envision these stackable structures to be deployed uh, in an, uh, how should I call it, uh, automated uh, fashion. Okay. Mm. Nice. Yeah, um, I'll follow up with you sometime. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I saw that you post this on YouTube sometimes. Yes. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, that that will be great. So I can <laughs> show it to to my family. <laughs> ah, good, good. Uh, that's great. Uh, okay, so it was very nice uh, talking uh, to you, Sachin, to everyone. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to uh, uh, answer any questions and. Yeah, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> oh, very much so. And I am, I think we saved the best for last. So thank you for the thank great, you. Appreciate great presentation. It. I look forward to interacting with you. Yes, definitely. You know, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, will, I will be very happy to follow up with you at some point to eventually think about any, any type of collaboration that we can do. And of course, hopefully, uh, we, I can also take a trip over there or invite you here <laughs> whenever yeah. these restrictions go off. <laughs> so, 
Hopefully so. Soon. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. It was a, it was a big honor for me to uh, speak nice. uh, at San Diego State University. Uh, it's a uh, it's very nice to also meet you, and hopefully yeah. one day we can take a visit and seeing you in person. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, 